We live drums. Hi, welcome back. Gary France here. I just played a short little melody that I improvised from Dance Macabre for you on the marimba, which demonstrates the range of the instrument. This is a five octave instrument, and uh, we play it with either two mallets or with four mallets, and we'll talk about the grips in a second. Let's talk a little bit about the construction of the instrument. The marimba has wooden bars that are made out of rosewood. Some, there are some other wood, woods that are used, but pretty much it's rosewood. Honduras rosewood was terrific. A lot of our rainforests have been depleted of good rosewood, so we have some substitute plantation woods. This mm -hmm. instrument is a Honduras rosewood. Let's look at the construction of it. I'm just gonna slide it along. You'll note that this particular instrument has height adjustment on it. Down here on the bottom, I've got a ratchet where I can turn it and I can raise the instrument up quite high. It just ratchets up or it can go down. This is an important aspect when we're working with our young people who are different heights. The challenge with most marimbas is getting them to go low enough and we'll learn a little bit about that and the reason why. The first reason is that the lower your bar, think about the marimba bars and your pitch is as the same as pipes on an organ. You know when you look at a big pipe organ, you see those giant pipes for the low notes. That's because there's a relationship between the resonator and, and the, the pitch of the bar. Now I've got a set of resonators I'm going to show you right here on this Yamaha instrument. We're going to just rotate this out. You can see here that we have these tubes hanging down in front of our resonators, okay? Let me just remove our bars for you. These are rosewood bars as well. And you note that I'm just, just actually gonna pick them up. They're just on a string and they just really, they just lift off the instrument. Let's get a close up of the bars. You can see from the underneath of the bar that we actually have a single piece of wood that is cut away. You have a point on the wood where the string goes through, right through here. This is called the nodal point, the point where there isn't any vibration. 
Then we have the antinode, the point where there's most vibration here. And then, of course, a mirror image at the other side. I'm holding these bars up. You can see that they're strong. Really, not unlike the bars that were on the balafone and the gil that we looked at earlier. I'm just going to set them down here, and let's take a look at the construction of this instrument. Well, we, ha we have the bars are on the instrument, and they're suspended by a series of rails. And the rails lift right off of your concert marimba. This is a rail assembly, and it folds right in half for easy packing up. That's pretty much the construction of most of our marimbas. They'll fit in the back of many of our cars. Our resonators are tuned tubes, very much like you have on the organ, and you can see that they're sitting behind the rails. Now you might say, wow, I see a beautiful curve here in these resonators. Well, that's a decorative curve. Let's look at a set of resonators. I brought here a set of resonators from the vibraphone. You'll note that they reflect from low to high, that we have the longest tube on bottom, which, which is for your low notes, and a, and a high, a very short tube on top. In fact, they're stopped. I'll just set this down here. So we have longer tubes at this end for the high notes, which are merely decorative. Let me, and I might add that this set of resonators also comes in half, in two pieces. We're going to lift these off, and I'm going to hold it up for our video team to, to film. If you look up in the top here, look at how short the distance is. It's less than one one knuckle on my, on my digit finger goes in right here. That's really how short that resonator tube needs to be. No longer than that. So that's really for look on these big, big front resonators on this instrument. I'm just going to set this one down here now. The resonators are made out of aluminum or aluminum. And they're light, they're not too heavy to move. We do have some beautiful concert instruments that have brass resonators. There are some marimbas made with PVC tube resonators. What's important is that the air column inside the resonator is allowed to vibrate sympathetically with the bar. So you can see that this particular instrument, once I start stripping it down, really packs up quite neatly. And you can see the back here that the resonators really go from low to high and that we don't have the decorative feature uh, that we do on the front resonators. So this is, a, uh, this is a Yamaha instrument, really a terrific instrument, and you can note there's a little bit difference in the color. This is a little bit darker rosewood. Back here is an older Premier instrument, also rosewood. Let's have a quick listen, if we could, to some of the different different instruments. This instrument is a four octave instrument. We don't have a specific uh, range like we do on pianos, let's say it's exactly, you know, eight octaves or, or whatever. The marimbas can be four octaves, they can be three and a half octaves, they can be five octaves, they can be six octaves, and they all sound a little bit different. Let's have a listen. We'll play C natural, middle C, on each one of the instruments. Here's our middle C on this instrument right here. Here's our middle C on this instrument here. We can really hear That, that difference in the wood. Four octaves, four and a third, down to a low A. Lowest note here is a C. The low A here, all the way down to a low C. So that's basically the nuts and bolts of the marimba. 
rosewood bars, resonators. The resonators aren't always round. If you take a look at this Adam instru Adams instrument here made in Holland, at the bottom of the resonators, you can see that our resonator opens up into a square, almost trapezoidal shape. The science and tuning of bar percussion is a very complicated and exacting science, and there are some wonderful dissertations available about the tuning and making of marimbos. I would, I would urge you to check out not only the standard si internet sites, but also the dissertation of James Moore, and also go to PAS.org. That's the Percussive Art Society International. There you'll find a wealth of information about making and tuning marimbas. Remember that these marimbas that are in this video are different than the folkloric marimbas of East Africa, which are, are roughly hewn instruments and pentatonic in scale, although now I've seen several made diatonically. So these are concert instruments played in orchestras tuned at either A40 or A442. So very exact tuning, and we can get into whether you're tuning the harmonics and and whether it's quint tuning or exactly the different types of tuning is getting very involved. But I think for, for basic purposes to know that the, the instruments are uh, tuned roughly A440, A442. Okay, so that's it. Let's, let's get into a little bit of information about the grip and playing the marimba. We're going to take a quick pause and we'll be back while I reset here to get one instrument in shape. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Gary France, and welcome back to our video on keyboard percussion, the marimba. This video will focus on the grip and tone production. Well, tone production on the bars, we play the bars pretty much in the center of the bar. We talked about, in our last video, we saw the shape of the bars, and we saw the nodal point and the anti-node and where you play. But let's just grab some mallets. You'll note that I've got my mallets now sitting down here in front of me. They hang in front of the marimba, and this is where marimba players often keep their mallets. I'm going to grab a set of four, and we'll just start looking. I'll just grab a nice soft one, and we'll look at the tone production aspect. Now, you can really hear the difference in where you play on a marimba compared to a xylophone. We're just going to play this E flat, and I'm going to play on the node. On the node is where the string goes through the instrument, and it's the point of the least vibration. I'm going to slowly strike the bar or play the bar moving outward toward the anti node. Now onward toward the edge. Well, that's surprising. The edge actually creates a pretty good tone as well. If we measure the distance from the, the rope or the string that goes through to the edge, we have roughly that much of my mallet. If we measure that distance from the node out that brings us to about here on the bar. The difference between here and the center, you can really hear the pronounced difference. Am I dead center or am I slightly off center? They both sound a little bit different as well. So, here it's a little bit more critical to try and play in the center of your bars. We can play on our nodes as a matter of an effect, a musical timbre. Okay, the grip. We hold, when we're playing with two mallets, it's exactly the same as our xylophone grip. It's a matched grip. 
and we play in very much the same way. Now there are several different grips for holding four mallets and each person really has to come up with something that's comfortable for them. I'm going to grab another set of mallets, sort of uh, some daily practice mallets that I have here and I have a wide selection of mallets. The first grip I'm going to show you is a grip that we, we call the Stevens grip and in this grip what I'm going to do is I place one mallet in these back two fingers here and I'm holding it like so. My front mallet hangs in my hand and I can move the mallets like so. Okay, this is something I'm showing you very, very quickly. Here's a pair of mallets. These mallets have a white birch shaft so that it's not flexible. It will snap if I bend it. The first mallets that I showed you have a flexible shaft made out of rattan. Okay? They feel different, they sound different, and they play different. So for, for your choice, you know, it's a different choice each person has as to what they're going to play. You note that this mallet is, is wrapped quite tight and it's a bright mallet. Very bright. Let's hear it at the top. I'm using the Stevens grip. Take a look at my right hand. You'll note that I'm able to open and close. I have a great deal of dexterity with this grip. All right, let's grab something not quite as hard. Here we go, these will work. Again. Left hand, putting them together, this particular grip allows a great deal of flexibility and also gives us the, the ability to control all of our mallets and uh, move them independently. create a great deal of variety in rolling. So this is the Stevens grip and there are lots and lots of videos um, and, and materials available on this. So this is a very quick cursory introduction, the Stevens grip. The other grip that we have is called the Burton grip and that was uh, made famous by Gary Burton, our wonderful uh, virtuoso on the vibraphone. And this grip, what I do is I, I have a mallet which is coming through this finger here in between my first finger, my index finger, and my middle finger. It comes through there, and that just comes down through the center of my palm. Then I lay a mallet across that mallet, like so, and so this finger is over the top. You can see that, that lovely 90-degree uh, angle. Now the big advantage in this grip is that it allows me to play with my wrist in a straight up and down winding stroke, uh, waving stroke. To play with our two mallets together, I can, I can do the same independent type strokes. Not quite as, uh, it doesn't give me quite the flexibility, me personally, as the Stevens grip does, but I love the fact that it allows me to, to play my chords in a straight, a nice full on manner. A lot of the same things I can do with the Stevens grip, I can do here. But again, this gives me a little bit more power. That same exercise, let's see if I do the same thing. I can do a lot of the same technique. Uh, this one I use predominantly on the vibraphone, and I do use the Stevens grip 
uh, predominantly on marimba, I inter interchange a little bit. So that's a little bit about our grips. We have the match grip for our two mallets, we have the Burton grip, we have the Stevens grip. Now let's have a quick discussion about rolls and sustaining notes on the marimba. We've talked a little bit about our concept of, of sustaining uh, pitches and sounds on timpani. We will do further videos about rolls and things on snare drum. The thing to remember is that the roll is the illusion of a sustained sound. One more time, let's repeat that. The roll is the illusion of a sustained sound. It's not really a sustained sound. We can have a sustained uh, marimba one note. You'll hear that you have an attack and a decay. That's the envelope of our sound. We have an attack and a decay. If we listen to my attack and decay, I'll grab something a little brighter on the high note of the, of the marimba, there's not a lot of decay there. It's mostly attack. When we think about the xylophone, that fits really well in that. But the question is, how do we sustain that sound? What do we do to create the illusion of a sustained sound? Well, the human mind is an incredible, uh, incredible thing. And it, the human mind will take everything in that it's hearing and sensing, and it will create something for you. It will, it will help you to believe. So for example, if I'm going to play a high note on the xylophone up here, you're able to discern every one that I'm playing. As I speed it up, at a certain point, your mind says, oh, that's a continuous sound. Are you able to count how many notes I'm playing? Right? We create this illusion of a sustained sound. For example, let's say I'm going to play a chorale something maybe in F major. We create this idea or this illusion that we're going to have a beautiful melody that's connected and we get that illusion of a sustained sound. Now let's look at what would happen if I mixed up the mallets and I, I sort of went one, two, four, three, for example. So it was. And I can speed up the mallets. Now we're hearing and again we're able to create the delusion. You notice that I was able to bring out the melody a little bit. Here I'm playing an independent roll with one hand, bringing in the other so they're rolling at different speeds. I also have a harder mallet So my mallets are graduated, soft, medium, hardish, medium, and hard. So I'm able to create soprano, alto, tenor, and bass voices. Different types of techniques for rolling can create completely different um, 
uh, timbres and textures on the marimba. So it's important that we explore the different rolling, different timbres, playing on different parts of the bar. Here's our roll, but this time we're starting on the nodes. The nodal point, moving out. Texturizing. Gives us a great deal of control. Now these are, this is pretty much the nuts and bolts of marimba playing. And I'm not, this is at a very elementary to intermediate level. And we've covered, we've covered the tonal qualities. We've covered what it's made out of. We've looked at different kinds of mallets. Of course, they all make it sound different. And we've looked at the grips and a little bit on rolls. That's pretty much our basic lecture on the marimba. There are lots of great materials for advanced marimba playing, and I would encourage you to have a, a look at it. There's a, mostly marimba.com, and there's, there's many, many wonderful uh, sites developed, uh, dedicated only to marimba. So I, I hope you find this uh, informative. My name's Gary France. If you have more questions, you can always send them to me at garyfrance.com. Thank you for being with us today, and our next video will be on the glockenspiel. Thank you. We live drums.